Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to your horoscope for the week of June 14, 2020. I am your astrologer, Nadia Shaw. Thank you for being here. It is a powerful astrological week, but I do think that some of what we would think as the most powerful actually pales in comparison to a energy that has the potential there for true transformation, for true change. Yes, Mercury is going retrograde this week. By the time we get to the end of the week, we are entering the dark of the moon, preparing for a solar eclipse and the summer solstice happening at the beginning of next week. And next week as well, we're going to have Venus going direct, which means by the end of this week, Venus is slowing down to a standstill, magnifying her energies that much more. And so that in and of itself on the surface would seem important and would seem powerful. But I do think that one of the more important energies playing out this week is going to involve Pluto and Jupiter. In fact, it is these two planets and the eighth house and the ninth house that I do want to spend some time speaking about. It will be on Monday that the sun will reach out to Pluto in a type of conversation that astrologers call a quincunx. And on Tuesday, the sun will connect with Jupiter in this way. Now, a quincunx is a more modern astrological conversation. We don't see it mentioned in some of the older astrological texts like Tetrabiblos by Ptolemy, which is considered the foundational text to Western astrology. But it is this very conversation that does denote a quick need to integrate energies and that there is intensity and yet the possibility and the potential for quick resolution is there as well. But it doesn't end there. It is going to be later in the week on Thursday that Mars will connect with Pluto and on Saturday, Mars will connect with Jupiter. Pluto and Jupiter right now are moving towards their second exact connection to perfect later this month. But Mars is going to make a different type of connection to these two power players. And it is what astrologers call a sextile. This is considered harmonious, but it's the type of harmony where you identify how and where things could be better. And because you feel that they could be better and you see a pathway to it, you take action. And in taking action, you are able to improve your circumstances. In us being willing to own these energies, we are able to advance ourselves forward. Now, Mars, of course, is continuing to move through the sign of Pisces. I spoke about Pisces and Mars here at length last week. This is an energy that is inspiring compassion. It is inspiring change right now. But how to best use our energy to move towards the change we desire? Well, that may not necessarily be as clear just yet. We are going to be learning about this more and more as we navigate into Mars moving into Aries before the month is even over into Mars in shadow and then eventually retrograde as we get towards the end of July. So I'll be here to talk about it every step of the way. The retrograde happens in the fall. It happens September and into November, but Mars will go into shadow at the end of July. But for this week and to bring the energy back to this week, I wanted to talk about Pluto and Jupiter and their association with the eighth house and the ninth house respectively. Now, the 8th house and Pluto, you know, you kind of almost hear this dun, dun, dun kind of energy, right? Because they have such a heavy and consequential connotation to them. And rightfully so, it is Pluto that speaks to the mythological Hades. This is the god of the underworld. And it is in those hidden spaces that so much takes place. And mythologically, it was Hades who was consumed by his father. His father, Saturn, was so worried that one of his sons would become a greater god and a greater king than he ever could be, that the fear and the jealousy of that led him to consume his sons. He consumed Pluto. Now, imagine the trauma of that, of your own father wanting to obliterate your existence, wanting you to return to 
where you came from as if you never existed. And so in this way, we can understand how Pluto speaks to that very deep, hidden, often hidden, trauma that's under the surface. And how much of that trauma we have healed will depend on either how hidden it is or how much it is we're able to utilize some of the higher energies of Pluto, which have to do with speaking of that pain, speaking honestly and transforming the energy in the process. And this is why I think that the eighth house, which has a correspondence to the energy of Pluto, is associated with things like the alchemical process. It is associated with the occult. It is the hidden arts, the esoteric arts. And it also speaks to psychoanalysis as well. It is in speaking the things that we don't normally want people to know. And especially in those safe spaces created in the therapeutic journey and in the therapeutic process that we're able to take those things that have burdened us, that have made us feel heavy and turn them into gold, turn them into a source of great wealth. But it is a meticulous process. It is slow. And if Hades has anything, Hades has patience. Pluto has patience at that. But it is the eighth house that speak to the secrets we don't tell others. And there's a saying, we are as sick as the secrets we keep. And this is why in safe spaces and where it has been well earned, it is thought to be incredibly healing to speak out loud, to share those very things. This is also why this part of the sky, the eighth house, has an association with intimacy. Because it is an in intimacy that we actually end up healing something much deeper, much more profound. It is in truly allowing ourselves to be seen completely to another person and to know that we are loved and accepted that we are able to find that much more a deep layer of acceptance for ourselves. And it is for this very reason why it is thought that true emotional intimacy can heal the deepest and oldest wounds. And so it is from this place we've shared, we've connected, we've understood our trauma, we've raised the energy and understood it as a force of transformation, a force of authenticity. We've done the work. We haven't skipped over steps. We didn't just connect with someone and, and decide that it was going to be a therapy session and scare somebody away. No, that trust was earned over a period of time. Although it can happen that we do meet people very spontaneously, end up sharing and find it to be a catalyst moment. Those catalyst moments that change you profoundly and move your life in a different direction, they are also found here in the eighth house. And it is from this place, right, whether we've healed our traumas or not, that we then go on to the ninth house. We then go on to embrace Jupiterian energy. And Jupiter, of course, is hope. It is spirituality. The ninth house is our worldview. It is how we perceive and make sense of the world around us, our philosophical orientation. It is the literal interaction with the world as well, whom it is we perceive as other to us and how we engage them. But it is in the ninth house that we find belief in a larger sense. And you can tell a lot about a person based on what their beliefs are about the world, what philosophical orientation that they hold. You can tell a lot about what traumas they have healed, what traumas they are not ready to look at, where it is that healing is an ongoing process. And some would say it is forever an ongoing process. It is the journey of being human. But if you wanna know, if you wanna glimpse into what this person has healed what they're working on, what they don't realize they're working on, find out something about what they believe. And we can see this show up in the world in phenomenal ways, especially now when the energy is so heightened and the energy is so strong. And I'll tell you, we've just barely glimpsed it. 
We are at the very beginning. I have been saying again and again, the world, when we get to the end of this decade, will be a very different place than it is at the beginning of this decade. The shift is happening right now, but it will be right around July 1st, that Saturn is gonna retrograde out of the sign of Aquarius, that is gonna shift energy, it's gonna to return to the sign of Capricorn, that's gonna calm things down a little bit. But then once we get to December, it is going to be a forward momentum from there. So why do I mention this? Because right now the world is going through a whole lot of shift and a lot of people are looking at Saturn in Aquarius to speak to this and it does in some ways, right? Coming back to the eighth house, I have felt with this very intense year that we are in, when we look at things like the pandemic, it is true that, and we can say that there's so much we don't know and we can accept that. And there are a lot of theories out there, right? There's a whole lot of theories and a whole lot of conspiracy theories out there. And it has been interesting to observe what it is that people feel drawn to. It is a different state of spirit to say, okay, we don't know. But it's another state to say, this is the truth. This is what's hidden. This is what I know. It is that space, that worldview that is affirmed in what people choose to believe that speaks to what they have done in the eighth house, what it is perhaps they have yet to do, what it is that possibly is work that they may not be ready to do in this lifetime, and that is okay too. But now we advance, right? We start moving through that energy and we get to where we are right now. And what is happening right now for the collective, it is the root it is the trauma for a whole lot of people it is trauma that is coming to the surface and that is being looked at and in some cases it's been there just under the surface for a long time in some cases there have been people who have strived to work with it but now it is all bubbling forward that is saturn meeting pluto at the beginning of the year that is us collectively moving towards Jupiter meeting Pluto, magnifying the energy of Pluto as we move forward towards the end of this month. And so we can expect this collective sense of people either embracing or looking at or allowing their trauma to come forward, knowing that they have to move through it if they're going to get to the ninth house, if they're going to get to an authentic sense of hope and inspiration and a genuine sense of enthusiasm for their lives and for their future. Sometimes you have to move through that guck. If you think about Pluto, this also speaks to tar, it speaks to oil. Moving through the tar to get to that space where you're able to see a wider world on the other side. Then that journey towards the ninth house, that journey towards Jupiter is ultimately healing. Now, Jupiter, mythologically, is a different energy. Jupiter's father was also Saturn. But his mother, Rhea, seeing that Saturn was eating his children, she gave Saturn a rock and tricked him into thinking that it was Jupiter, baby Jupiter. And then Jupiter went off, right? And he was raised in love. He was raised with the most amazing mentors. He was raised knowing that he was meant to be a great king. He was meant to be the greatest of all gods. And that was prophecy. He knew that. And he was raised that way with this, this environment where people believed that about him. Now, imagine how different the psyche is of, in this case, an ancient Greek god, but imagine how different the psyche is when it is in an environment, when it grows in an environment, knowing that there is love, there is certainty of their greatness, as opposed to an environment where there has been tremendous denial, tremendous pain. And when we see that, we can start to understand these energies. And these energies are wanting to be known right now. My dear 
professor, my former professor, Jeffrey Cornelius said that the gods need us to remember them. They grow, they become more visceral, more real, the more it is that we remember who they are. And whenever it is that we gaze upon the sky, and I would even argue whenever it is that someone reads a tiny little horoscope in the back of a, of a magazine or a newspaper, right? Those two, three little lines, that is a very quiet affirmation of a universe that is alive, not only with love and wisdom and meaning and purpose, but a universe that is alive with the sacred. And because you in your chart, you have Pluto in your chart, you've got Jupiter in your chart, that means that these divine energies exist in you and through you. They are a part of you. These are energies that you can understand. In your own chart, you have an eighth house. You have a ninth house. The eighth house tells you what you are healing, how you go about healing it, and what you may find on the other side having healed. And then the ninth house is how you feel engaging the larger world. How do you do that? It was the Buddha who said that life is suffering and there are uh, sort of literal forms, of course. He identified uh, things like we are gonna grow old, we are going to become sick. It is a part of the human experience is that there is going to be suffering. And he also said that there is an escape from that suffering as well. And it had to do with being in the present moment, understanding your essential nature, stepping outside of attachment to the physical experience. These were some of the things that he taught. But too often what does happen is that people want to skip over the eighth house and they want to jump right to the ninth, right? They want to jump right to everything is great and everything is what you believe it to be. And I believe that the world is, is perfect and nothing's wrong with it and all of these problems, they don't even exist. There are people who want to do that and that's fine, but what they're doing is that they're skipping over the eighth house. They're not even willing to acknowledge the suffering that has been there. And if you have spent any time in new age circles, you've probably met people like this. And you've probably met people where you know it's just under the surface that this is a person that does not want to look at their eighth house, but their eighth house is showing up. They do not want to look at Pluto, but their Pluto, it's showing up in there. They just aren't ready or willing to look at it, but it shows up in our lives. It's one thing to tell yourself things are a certain way. And you know what? There's a time for that. If you're having beautiful Jupiter aspects in your chart, beautiful Jupiter transits, then yes, believe and, and enjoy that feeling and watch wonderful things manifest. It can be so. But you know when you're having a hard aspect of Pluto, when Pluto is square or conjunct one of your personal planets, it just isn't going to work. Pluto is going to make you look at the guck. It's going to make you look at what it is that you haven't wanted to acknowledge before. And so with this week, on Thursday, Mars speaking with Pluto, this is going to inspire us. This is going to help us to understand that the work is worth it. On a personal level, it may stir our unconscious. On a collective level, it may stir our collective unconscious, powerfully so. But the sextile is, by its nature, empowering. It is about understanding what action we can take. And then Mars speaking in harmony with Jupiter as we get to the end of the week. Well, this is going to be energy that is positively inspired, where action rooted in compassion is able to bless that much more of our lives. And so we will see this on a collective level, certainly, but in our own lives, on a personal level as well. All of us are being asked to engage with Pluto and with Jupiter. At the beginning of the week, as the sun in Gemini is connecting in quincunx to Pluto, to Jupiter, what this tells me is that through communication, conversation, information coming through in very surprise and quick thinking ways, 
each one of us is going to have to look at how it is that we have integrated Pluto in our lives, how it is that we've integrated Jupiter. Where is it that with the sun in Gemini, we're just telling ourselves something and we don't really believe it because we know it's just a, a Band-Aid that isn't working anymore. Where it is that we haven't wanted to acknowledge the trauma of others because we're unable to see it within ourselves. We're unable on a level of our psyche to acknowledge our own trauma, our own sadness, that we can't even allow that for someone else. With the sun in Gemini speaking to social media, ultimately, uh, it should be very interesting to see what kind of information is distributed. And chances are it is going to be very provocative uh, and it is going to be something that a lot of us are talking about, but ultimately it gives us an opportunity to look more deeply at how it is that we are integrating our own Pluto and our own Jupiter. And I truly do believe that it is in healing that ultimately we are raised. We are able to become more conscious. And what that means is to consciously decide our way forward. We're never going to be perfect. We are human beings and we are here ultimately to learn. This is the earth school, as Gary Zukov called it. And we're not going to be perfect at it. And that really is okay. There's a lot of freedom in accepting that. But it is in looking at what is provoked within us that we're able to use whatever transpires towards our own elevation and towards our own movement, towards embracing that very energy that I like to call love and wisdom. You can't get to the full embrace of love and wisdom without at least acknowledging any pain that gets in the way of that full embrace. And if there is any of that pain, it may show up in very surprising ways in the early part of the week, but the tools to heal them will show up before the week is over. Now, there was one other thing I wanted to mention to circle it back to what I was talking about with Saturn before, right now in Aquarius. So there's a lot of desire for social change. And a lot of people are looking at this phrase, uh, defund the police, right? And uh, they're saying this is Saturn and Aquarius. And yes, the phrase itself is, it's shocking on the surface, right? But when you really hear what people are saying, actually what they're talking about is Chiron and Aries. I did a whole video on Chiron and Aries a couple years back, and I'll link to it in the description below. But it was in that video that I spoke about a more holistic way of understanding the experience of law enforcement, the warriors, the soldiers in our in our world, right? What is it that is happening to them? What energy are they bringing? And where does true and genuine healing need to happen in that sphere? And I spoke about that. And so when I hear defund the police, I think, yes, it's shocking. And you know, Aquarius, it is about the shock. It is all about the future. Whereas Capricorn, where Saturn is gonna to return to soon enough, is about carrying forward tradition and preserving. It is Aquarius that cares nothing about that. That's let's bring on the next and the new. The future is all that matters. It is Capricorn that says, I have built and manifested this success based on what's been before in the here and now. This is the fulfillment of it. And then Aquarius says, none of that matters, okay? We are moving on. It's all about the next and the future is where we are living in. And so, yes, it is a shocking energy and we're in it right now. And so we have these shocking phrases, but we are also in Chiron and Aries. And this is going to allow us right to the middle of the decade to reimagine what law enforcement can be, to think about it very holistically, from the experience, not only uh, for those uh, that are uh, the people, the community, but also the experience of those who are asked to enforce. And we also have Mercury going retrograde on Thursday as well, right? So there's so much going on here. We are in an extended eclipse season and that 
Mercury going retrograde in the sign of Cancer is going to ask us to look at the past. It's going to ask us to look at our roots. It's going to ask us to consider and reconsider home and patriotism and what that really means for each of us. Now, it is Cancer that is also interested in preserving the past as well. So here's what I'm going to say. And, you know, I have a friend actually who recently started working with museums and things like that. And as I was preparing this video, I literally left her a message on WhatsApp and I said, I was about to say this, so I'm saying it to you. If you know anybody who works in museums and cares about preserving history, and if you are one of the people, because there's been a lot of mixed reactions to monuments coming down. Some are older than others, like the monuments that are in Europe are a lot older than some of the monuments that are in the US, which are in some cases just a couple decades old. But if you are one of those people who wants to preserve them for historical value, then I would say contact the people that you know, your friends who may work within museums because Saturn moving back into Capricorn, that is gonna to want to preserve. Mercury retrograde in Cancer, that is going to invite us to look at where we have been, what we wanna take into the future, where to put things in the right place. But in addition, it is, um, cancer that is considered very emotional as well. So there's going to be heightened sensitivity around these matters, around preserving the past. And so, yes, if you know somebody like that, it would be a good time to get on that and to do that. If that's something you want to do, lock these monuments away somewhere in a museum for their historical value, because Saturn is going to go back into the sign of Aquarius in December. And Jupiter is going to meet that Saturn in December as well, magnifying the energy of that Aquarian energy. And we are fully going to start stepping into the Aquarian age where the past doesn't matter, where it is all about the future. It is the revolutionary energy that is coming. We are getting a taste of it right now. But the big shift is coming up, not only with Jupiter and Saturn, that is going to be huge in and of itself, the great conjunction, but also based on Pluto going into Aquarius, that really is about living in the future in phenomenal ways. I've made videos about a lot of this stuff. And again, I will link to them below the decade ahead video as well. And I'll continue talking about this, of course, but we are looking at the past differently with this Mercury retrograde. And ultimately, my hope is that this perception brings with it genuine healing, but also genuine acceptance for wherever it is that people are in their journey. Because wherever it is that they are, it is okay. Because ultimately, as part of the mystery, it kind of works together to move more and more of us towards the conscious decision to align with love and wisdom. And that is powerful. What I love about this week for us, there is so much here, but I am going to say the great setup for Jupiter and Pluto connecting in the sky later this month. Well, we're gonna to start to feel it now, early in the week with an energy of quincunx, that's going to have us feeling some stress, some uncertainty, having to think quickly, but able to cultivate blessings. And then energy of empowerment, genuine empowerment as a Mars sextile can bring. But it is ultimately part of a rare and special time, an extended eclipse season that we are in the middle of right now as part of a rare and special time the year that we are in the middle of right now, starting with a once in 500 year configuration, ending with a once in 600 year configuration. And all of this is to say that the world is changing and it's changing really quickly. And that can actually be really exciting, especially where it is that we are interested in creating a world of genuine, healing of genuine self-knowledge that ultimately can't help but lend itself to the enthusiastic and honest and aware 
embrace of love and wisdom. Well, thank you so much for watching. What do you love about this week? Let me know in the comments below. Please like, subscribe, share, ring the bell, all of that good stuff. It does mean so much and I love reading you guys. And of course, if you wanna know how all this wonderful stuff this week speaks to you and your sign, log on to NadiaShaw.com. Sign up to be one of my superstars. Superstars get expanded exclusive video scopes each and every week unlimited access to special horoscopes. They get live events every new moon and so much more free gifts from time to time. Uh, all of this in the superstar space. I look forward to meeting you there. I did finally, after a two year delay, get my YouTube Creator Award and I've made a special video, but it isn't posted yet. I'm still working on it. I recorded it is a more accurate way to put it, uh, but be on the lookout for that. And thank you to everybody on social media who's been sharing love and congratulating me. Thank you so much for that. It is not about the award. It's about who you become in the process, but it's a lovely reminder uh, of the trust that you have shared with me. And that means so much to me. So. Thank you. And again, be on the lookout for that uh, video where I thank you profusely and properly and reflect a little bit on my YouTube journey as well. And of course, books. Books are a great way to expand your astrological awareness and knowledge and insight uh, and appreciation. And I have got a bunch of books. I have the Body and the Cosmos, where I take Plato's ideas and apply them to an astrological sky. I have Prayers to the Sky, which is a book of astrological magic and myth that I hope that you love. It has a practical element to it, a mythological element to it. The stories I shared with you about Jupiter and Saturn and Pluto, the mythological stories, you can find them in that book. And I have Astrology Realized, which is a great introduction to the history and philosophy and practice of astrology. And I have an upcoming book as well, The Universe is Wise and Loving, looking at the nodes of the moon. And I'll have more details on that, but that'll be available wherever books are sold. Along with these, they are now available wherever books are sold. Um, but that book, August 22nd. Speaking of the nodes, tomorrow on Sunday, I do have a class that I am going to be teaching. Now, if you purchase the Universe is Wise and Loving advanced copy, you should be getting an email or you would have already gotten an email with your uh, class access, but you can still join. If you haven't gotten the advanced copy, that's okay. Uh, you can still join by visiting synchronicityuniversity.com. I am going to be looking at uh, the nodes moving from the Cancer Capricorn axis and into the Gemini Sagittarius axis, what that means for the collective, but also what that means for the different signs as well. So we're gonna cover a lot in this 90 minute class. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun and it's gonna be taught tomorrow. If you can join us live, that's wonderful. If you can't, that's okay as well because there will be the download available to all students who register for this class. And I look forward to meeting you there. And Synchronicity University Summer School is right around the corner. Next weekend, we are going to start a wonderful summer school. Choose Your Own Tuition Rate is available for just a few more days where you can access classes for as low as $5 a class only for a limited time. Like I said, it's just a few more days to go. A limited number of scholarships are available as well. And so all of that, the link to apply, info on the classes, and the classes are gonna be amazing. It's going to be Uranus, part one and two, in the astrology chart. Neptune, part one and two, in the astrology chart. And then we're gonna do part two of Mars. We already did part one in the spring session. And so all of that, the links that you need, the information that you need, the sign up, the scholarship, all of it is available at synchronicityuniversity.com and I look forward to meeting you in class. And finally, my partnership with Cosmogram. Thank you, thank you so much for your love, for your trust, uh, for the enthusiasm you have for uh, this offering. There has been just such a lovely outpouring of uh, enthusiasm and support. A lot of people have really loved it and it's gotten incredible feedback. And for that, I am truly so very grateful. So I've teamed up with Cosmogram to offer personalized astrology reports. Uh, and this is you putting in your uh, information 
and within hours you get a report and that report is looking at the different planetary aspects in your chart and my interpretation of them. And so I hope that this is something that you cherish always that continues to give you valuable insights into self. It was a lot of work. It was an ambition. It was a dream. And that dream came true when I offered this. And it means so much for it to be embraced the way that it is. So thank you for that. And if you want to learn more about my take on your unique birth chart, click on the link below. And thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for my YouTube Creator Award to all of you guys. Like I said, that video is going to be out. But thank you also for continuing to be part of my spiritual journey, part of my spiritual path. It really does mean so much to me. And for being here as part of affirming love and wisdom in the world. I do think that if we are going to fully embody love and wisdom, we have to acknowledge where it is that perhaps something also needs to heal. And this is certainly within us, but in the collective as well. And we are at an important moment. I do feel for the collective, we are shifting into a whole new world and a whole new paradigm. The end of the decade, the world will look very different. And yes, right now it can feel uncertain, but I do believe that any effort taken towards genuine healing, inner healing, spiritual healing, psychological healing, and also healing on a level of the planet, healing on a level of society, all of it. When it comes from a place rooted in love and wisdom, the work is worth it. Thank you again for watching. It'll be a great week. Enjoy.